welcome everybody. And uh, for a starter, for those who are not aware where they are, we're on Sadiyat Island, and sometimes called the Museum Island, because in five years there will be a total of over 160,000 square meters of exhibition space on this island. And that's why today our topic is one of the reasons. Uh, in, uh, aside from that, uh, neighboring countries such as Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, and Kuwait all have plans for opening new museums and have already done so, actually, or expanding all, all other older ones. Also, several other museums, when, when, when there was peace at least, had plans for museums in the region. And China, for one, is opening over 100 museums per year reaching over 4,500 just in the last four years alone. Uh, these are government museums and private uh, museums for, by, uh, opened by private collectors. All this is coupled with a growing creative industry led by young entrepreneurs passionate about art and culture. There are at least 50 commercial galleries in Dubai and over 215 non for profit Arab art organizations in this region. Also, global interest in art is focusing, forcing us to rethink the strategies for exhibitions and for education and training of art professionals, as well as heritage and museum professionals. So what is the role of these professionals in the 21st century, and how is a new research changing the way museum professionals view their visitors? Today, I have the pleasure uh, to introduce four leading academics and museum professionals who are uniquely qualified to respond to these questions. Their presentations will be followed by a brief discussion among the presenters, and then we will open to your questions. First, I'd like to pre present uh, Marjorie Schwarzer on my left here. Marjorie is the co-director of the Museum Studies graduate program at the University of San Francisco in the US. An award-winning museum scholar and educator, Marjorie has worked in leadership positions at several major science and children museums in the US and has developed and taught a range of graduate courses from museum management, project management and financial analysis to, to museum history. Her book, Riches, Rivals, and Radicals, 100 Years of Museums in the United States, is in its second printing, and she has also authored over 50 articles on a range of contemporary museum issues. I'd like also to add that Marjorie, for the last five years, has been engaged in teaching museum uh, courses uh, for local professionals in the UAE. We've done courses together across the UAE in Sharjah, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. Welcome. We're very happy to have you here again. Uh, next to Marjorie is Glenn. Uh, Glenn Wharton is a visiting professor in museum studies at NYU Abu Dhabi with a regular appointment at NYU New York's campus. Over the years, he has worked at various sites of conservation, including archaeological excavations, museums, and art in public spaces. His current interests include uh, building documentation to represent and re-perform new art forms, such as media, installation, and performance art. He also researches and teaches about museum programming with communities and ad that address social and cultural uh, uh, concerns. Next uh, will be Moza. Moza Matar is an exhibition designer at the Abu Dhabi Tourism and Culture Authority, where she works on museum exhibitions for regional and international artists and collections. She holds an MFA in exhibition planning and design from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and has completed design research at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and at Al Madhaf, the Arab Museum of Modern Art. Last but not least is uh, my colleague, Lee Markopoulos, who is the chair of the graduate program in curatorial practice at California College of the Arts, San Francisco. Her educational practice is informed by over 25 years of experience in exhibition organizing at, art, at institutions, including London Serpentine and Hayward Galleries, as well as by an active career as a writer about contemporary art 
and an editor of exhibition catalogs and artist monographs. My, uh, Lee's uh, research focuses on art of the 60s and 70s, finds practical expression in her role as a director of the Stephen Liber Trust, which entails the stewardship of a large collection of uh, conceptual fluxes and minimal artworks and documents. And I'd like also to add that Lee was also engaged in the teaching in the UAE for the last four years. And she's here this week also uh, just completed a one-week seminar for the staff of TCA. And the same also for Mo Mose, who has, uh, we have worked together at TCA and conducted training programs for the staff. I'm going to start by just framing the, the big question here, which is why do we have five people here all associated with institutions from the United States talking about the museum professional in a global society? So Salwa and Glenn are both teaching at NYU Abu Dhabi based in the United States. Lee and I both teach in San Francisco. And Moza completed her graduate degree in Philadelphia. So, so what is it about the United States and museum professional practice that makes sense in a global society? Well, there have been three key contributions in the United States towards museum studies curriculum and museum professional curriculum. The first is ethics and professionalism. And this was pioneered beginning in 1906 with the founding of the American Alliance of Museums. The second is the focus on education and community, and this dates to the 1930s. And the third is the focus on entrepreneurship and business practices, which really got its start in the 1980s and is a fundamentally important part of being a museum professional today anywhere in the world. So what does museum studies do? These are all photographs, by the way, of Emirati students who I've had the pleasure of working with in the UAE. So some of you may recognize some of the people in this, these photographs. This museum studies as an academic or professional curriculum advances professionalism, articulates the ethics of our field, puts public service at the center, develops the scholarship that informs all of our work, and nurtures future talent. Social justice and ethical practice is a very large part of the work that I've been involved with. Oh, back to here. OK, so the three needs and the three areas of focus right now in museum studies curriculum, especially where I am at University of San Francisco, are social justice and ethical practice, the intersection between education and technology, and the role of new technologies in serving visitors better. And then this idea of entrepreneurship and leadership. How are we going to give young people the tools to lead museums into the future? And this is a photo. Some of you maybe are in the audience of a class that I worked with at TCA Abu Dhabi last year. So I want to close with showing you how the museum field has advanced with the, even with these foundational ideas of ethics, education, and entrepreneurship that underlie United States Museum Studies curriculum. In 1906, the American Alliance of Museums surveyed its members, and what you see here on the screen are the founding members of the first museum professional association in the United States about what are the key things that a museum director needs to know in order to do his job. And these were the four characteristics that they said were absolutely essential. Museum directors must know history. They must be able to raise money. They must know how to create exhibits. And they must be in good health. Because museum field 
now, like it is back then, is an exhausting endeavor. You are always on in our field. These are the key skills that are needed today. Business acumen. So it's not just a museum director that needs to know how to raise money. Everybody working in the museum needs to have an understanding of the organizational practices of the museum. Everybody, everybody in the field. And so this is something that universities are emphasizing. Research skills are essential, especially in our age of Google. If you Google something, that's not research. That's Googling something. Cultural openness, and this is something that I think you probably do very well at this university, but really having that tolerance and that understanding, that deep understanding of all cultures. Self-knowledge, knowing yourself and how you respond to situations. Flexibility, because museum work is very fast moving. A passion for learning, which is something that you will find with every museum professional you will ever meet, is very, very passionate about learning new things. Patience, not every museum professional you meet is really patient, but it's really an absolutely essential skill. And that graciousness that people think of for our field. Thank you. Well, we'll shift gears a little bit. I thought I would talk about professions who work with collections within museums. Um, I myself am a conservator. Uh, as Salwa mentioned, I've worked in various capacities on archaeological sites, in museums, actually in private practice, working for museums and public art collections, and, um, and now I teach. Um, and I've shifted over the years from archaeology to contemporary art. But let me back up a little bit and uh, first tell you a little bit about the conservation profession. We're trained in chemistry and material sciences, so it's, very, it's framed as a science, as, as a profession. And the idea is that we can know um, an art object or a, a collection object through materials research. Um, we study fabrication methods, we study material composition, we study deterioration, but of course, we always are right on the line um, with material and aesthetics, or material and cultural value, uh, because the objects in our care have both. Um, they're important, they're, they're charged um, culturally as well as materially. Um, so as, and so the graduate training programs, at least in the US and most of the world, require chemistry and material art as well as studying um, how art objects are made and how art objects fall apart. The only training program that I'm aware of in this region is in Doha. The University College London has a conservation uh, program that's heavily weighted towards archaeological materials, although they do address contemporary art as well. But there are conservation programs around the world. Um, other people who work with collections in museums include registrars and collections managers, um, which are somewhat synonymous depending on the institution. Um, a, a larger institution may have a collections manager who takes care of all concerns with, with objects, meaning um, helps with acquisition, cataloging in the collections management database, manages security, manages exhibition and storage environments, manages shipping, insurance. Um, so it, a collections manager is someone who sort of takes care of the object from, from A to Z, whereas the conservator is more involved sort of physically um, with, with the object, typically. Training for registrars and collections managers varies. There are very few, if any, graduate programs. So most people who are interested in these professions um, get a degree in museum studies today. Um, or they just learn on the job. They might get a job in a museum and learn how to do the work just there on the spot. And of course, there are lots of courses 
that you can take um, to improve your skills and, and your knowledge in, in these professions. Another area of collections work in museums are technical studies. Uh, so conservators, conservation scientists, and others with technical skills research collections uh, sometimes to uh, determine provenance or authenticity. Is it what it purports to be? Is it a fake? Uh, so we get involved in illicit trade of antiquities, um, uh, determining whether the corrosion on an archaeological object has been painted on or, or whether it's real. We can take radiographs, x-rays, we can examine objects through ultraviolet uh, light or infrared light or other methods in, in the lab to, um, to do what we call technical studies. Um, and art historians are getting interested in technical studies as well in this new emerging field of um, technical art history. And then finally, I'd like to just shift to Contemporary art. Um, I worked at the Museum of Modern Art in New York for seven years, just left about a year and a half ago, putting together a program to conserve media, performance, and installation art. And the big difference there was that the artists are alive. I'm used to working with artists who died many years ago, but with contemporary art, the artist is often alive and very much part of the work that we do in museums. They're there, um, we have the opportunity to interview them, to learn from them about how they want their works displayed, how they want their works to be conserved in the future. So my work shifted from real technical work with objects to working with living artists um, and building documentation, especially for installation and performance art, for what the work is and, and what it can be in the future as it, as it changes over time. Um, and a lot of that work was done in the installation phase where exhibitions were coming up. So um, with that, I'd like to hand you over to someone who can talk uh, with more expertise about um, exhibitions and exhibition design. The exhibition design, it's a mixture of um, everything, really. We, had, we worked with people who have an experienced background in business, finance, we worked with people who had um, a theater makeup experience. So it's a mixture of everything. We all work in different phases of the design to transform the design from um, a concept or a sketch into a reality to come up with a big show like in a museum or a gallery. And for um, the museum studies program, um, we usually work with um, where at one of the departments that works with a lot of other departments, ex uh, educators, creators, and um, communication. So um, we, we usually uh, go through exhibition design into um, five different phases. Um, the, f uh, the first one is the content development, which is the most important one because um, we deal with a lot of people from different backgrounds uh, trying to make this one space that's going to um, hopefully get the entrance of a lot of people who's going to visit the exhibition. And then the second phase is the schematic design, um, the design phase, and then the actual build-up of the design itself. And um, from my experience where, um, um, getting um, the, the, a higher degree in museum studies within the exhibition design, we learned a lot of skills that I didn't know that I'm going to need. We had um, courses in uh, painting, drawings, carpentry. Um, we also had courses in yoga just to, to get the mediation aspect of the <laughs> exhibition itself. Um, and the, diver the diversity of um, the people you work with and the different backgrounds really help in developing your own skills. And you see the exhibition from a different uh, perspective. Um, we also work with a lot of people from industrial design and set design because it's, it's about the theory and the concept of the exhibition itself. Um, we usually focus on the design in terms of um, visitor experience and um, how the visitor can experience the design and the concept of the exhibition itself. 
Um, of course, we can't satisfy everyone. Not everyone's going to like the exhibition or the design, but we do research and survey just to um, get an idea of uh, what type of audience that we're trying to attract. Great, so well, talking about exhibitions is a nice introduction to curatorial practice, so thanks for the lead-in. Um, curatorial studies, which is something I'm involved in, are definitely the newcomer in the field of educating museum professionals, but they are at the front line of the debate about what the curatorial role should or could be today. And the curatorial role is, of course, key to the research, interpretation, and display of museum collections. Uh, it's also increasingly becoming the public face of the institution, or at least that could be argued. Uh, when we established our program in 2003 in San Francisco in California, it was the first of its kind on the West Coast, and one of th only three in the US and not more than 10 throughout the world. So the first program was founded in 1986 in France. Um, our intention was and remains to support and educate students with the ambition to become what has loosely been termed independent curators at a time when the notion of who a curator is and could be and what he or she does um, is completely up for grabs and it's not necessarily linked to a museum collection. In other words, we direct our curriculum towards training the type of, curators, of curator who wants to exist and practice both outside and inside the museum. The type of curator who does not want to follow the study of art history but who is perhaps more interested in challenging conventions of exhibition making and display and in finding new venues and models for the presentation of art. This kind of curator has made the work of curating increasingly visible since the late 60s and uh, they really came of age in the 90s. And I'm talking here about curators like um, Oakwe and Weiser or hans Ulrich Oberst, Jens Hoffmann, um, who have operated mainly outside the museum, although many of them are working in museums today. They have not studied art history, but rather have learned their practice directly through working with living artists. They have furthered contemporary discourse around art through challenging accepted modes of framing artworks and ideas. They have promoted the exhibition as a forum for publicly presenting and consuming art, and they have acquired authority, prominence, and even celebrity. Of course, this has not happened without questions being asked about their responsibilities, allegiances, allegiances and even their roles. Uh, questions like, are we to understand these kinds of curators as mediators, producers, or editors? Are they working for or with artists, or are they posi positioning themselves as the creative thinkers par excellence in the art world? What is a curator when not bound to a museum? And can a curator be an authority on art when they haven't studied it, and when they're not in charge of a collection? These are just some of the questions we discuss uh, on our program. And for the purposes of tonight, let's understand a curator as someone who makes artistic production, by which I mean artworks, visible. Someone who brings them out of the spheres of production or the studio and commerce or the market and places them in a public context. Of course, the boundaries between institution and studio have become blurred, partly through post-studio practice and the way so many contemporary artists are working today. Think of Marina Abramovich, for example. And those between market and institution are also blurry, not least because curators are often active in both arenas. And so much of what determines an artist's place in the museum today is linked to their market value. And this fluid situation is further complicated by the claims of, the, of contemporary art to function globally. The world is now the curator's stage, and the 200 or so biennials existing today make that point clearly. So to return to curatorial studies, how can they help you to navigate or perhaps even more importantly, participate in these sorts of conversations and in this world. How can you establish what kind of curator you want to be and where you want to practice? And does this kind of education allow you enough flexibility to make changes along the way? And perhaps most importantly, given the conversation tonight, can curatorial studies help you find work in a museum? I can answer these questions partly by giving you some sense of what our students have achieved with their degrees. We've graduated 85 of them in just over 10 years. We're a small program, and we choose to stay that way. And of these, 20 have chosen to work in museums. So a good percentage, about 25%. They're currently in the curatorial departments in institutions as diverse as San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, 
LACMA LA, the HAMA, Cincinnati, in Lima, in the New Museum, New York, and the list goes on. What unites their activities is that they're all working on contemporary art and with contemporary artists. This is no surprise to us. Our program focuses on art post-1960 and on dialogues about the contemporary. It is, however, very gratifying to us to see that those of our students who have wished to pursue a museum career have found themselves equipped to do so. It must be added, though, that in addition to being amongst our most excellent students, these ones often have a specialization, for example, new media, photography, or even architecture, which gives a depth to their knowledge of contemporary art. Of our other students, about 40% are curating or even directing non-profit Kunsthalles, spaces without collections, but spaces that make exhibitions. About 30 or so are working independently. They have founded their own spaces or residency programs. Uh, or even commercial galleries, and a further 10% of these are writing or teaching or even participating in further education. Um, a couple of them are doing PhD programs. So all this is by way of saying that yes, curatorial programs such as ours, while offering a moment to analyze the history and role of the curator and to develop a particular curatorial practice, have also had a direct influence both on museum practice and on the landscape of the contemporary art world more generally. While we're on the curatorial subject, could you really explore further the, this, what distinguishes uh, curatorial studies from art history? Could sure. an art historian be a curator and vice sure. versa? That's a good question. We get asked this all the time. And um, so sure. how I like to think about it is very simply that art history or curatorial practice is applied art history. So uh, how we differentiate ourselves is we're based in an art college as opposed to a university. We're surrounded by artists who are making and thinking about making work all the time. So we have a direct relationship that's living and breathing to the contemporary artist. Um, we're also interdisciplinary. Curatorial practice doesn't just uh, focus on exhibiting art, but also on thinking about exhibiting architecture or design or even film. Um, so it's a mode of working in a way in relation to cultural production. Um, and lastly, um, Another thing that we're able to do, which maybe the history of art isn't able to do so much, is to be a little bit more experimental about what we study and what we produce. So um, when, for example, we study the history of exhibitions, um, we do so with an intent to further that history through coming up with new models of exhibition making, uh, new venues for showing exhibitions, and new ways of writing and thinking about them. That's no, yeah, I think uh, that's for now. I'm sure the, <laughs> the audience would have more uh, questions on this. Uh, Mose, could you give us an idea about when you came back after your graduate studies here and started working with the uh, tourism and cultural authorities, you immediately, I understand, uh, began uh, your work with the design, exhibition design, as an exhibition design officer. What, what are the, some of, give us an example of what areas you focused on more or adapted to the region. What did you, is there anything sp specific to the locality here that you had to focus on in your uh, exhibition design that you kind of felt works better here than, for example, in your experience in the U.S.? I think it's not about um, the place itself, it's about uh, who comes to the museum, who comes to the exhibition. Exactly. Um, so I think um, from my experience, mainly focusing on the design, uh, designing the visitor experience and the social interaction within the gallery itself, um, help attract more audience to the exhibition and to the institution itself. And if the exhibition concept um, I mean, exhibition concept has to be, um, has to focus on entrance of the audience themselves. Um, we had, um, of course, we can't satisfy everyone, but um, we had, a, uh, we, that's why we go through the content development phase where we study the audience and we study the targeted people that we want them to come to the institution itself, the, um, the exhibition. And then uh, we work a lot with education department to come up with a space that um, uh, evolves and uh, it's a mixture of uh, learning and studying and enjoyment. So um, just recently uh, we opened Seeing Through Light exhibition for uh, Guggenheim of Puppy and we have 
different people from different age group, from different backgrounds, coming to the exhibition for different reasons. Um, um, some of visitors were there just to see one artist that they want to see, like the installation. And other people just were, uh, came specifically for the workshop related to the exhibition. So it's about designing the experience that the visitor can experience along the exhibition itself. Whether it was um, in the States or in Abu Dhabi, it's just about the audience that we're targeting. And that's something I'd like to come back to Marjorie to explore mm -hmm. further the audience. But first, we want to stay with exhibitions and uh, curation here a little bit. Uh, I understand there is a new master's program in technical art history. Uh, or, uh, could you explain what is that exactly? Is the new field? Yeah, there study? is. Well, the only program that I know of is at the uh, Glasgow School of Arts. Although I was just in Mexico City about six months ago, and, and I believe the, um, uh, there's a university there that's also creating one. Okay. So it, it's a new field. Um, art historians traditionally have studied art through connoisseurship, through stylistic analysis. Um, and conservators and conservation scientists, as I mentioned, study art through technology, through um, material identification, through art um, fabrication processes. So this is a, it's a wonderful blending of, of these two approaches to studying art, um, looking at stylistic analysis and looking at material composition and fabrication technology. So with by using um, incorporating the tools and, and techniques that conservators and conservation scientists have developed, our historians are now able to learn much more about um, a work of art. You know, how did they do that? How did they achieve that thick impasto? Or how did they uh, achieve that really beautiful patina on, on a bronze sculpture? Um, but it's also applied to authentication studies. Is, is it, as I said, purport, it, what it purports to be? Um, there's been a number of um, fake Jackson Pollocks that have been out on the market recently. Um, so combining um, material analysis with stylistic analysis has allowed experts to identify, um, you know, at least questionable works of art, for instance, identifying the paint media, a specific polymer as being invented and patented after Pollock's death, um, pretty much ensures that at least that paint was applied to the canvas uh, after he died. Whether all of the paint was or, or not, that's you know, a matter for the investigators. So it's a really exciting, rich area of study. Um, I'm really happy to see more and more interest on the part of art historians to do kind of technical research. Well, that's very interesting because we see here an interdisciplinary approach to education, whether it's through the curatorial, working with exhibition design and education, the same as Mose was talking about visitors, so understanding visitors. And here we're talking about hist art historians knowing more technical side of the art. So what about the visitors, Marjorie? How do, you, how do you prepare the future professionals, museum professionals, to be more aware of their visitors and diversity, particularly in this world now we live in? As Moses said, she did not find much difference between working in the US with a diverse population there, probably, yeah. and the diversity here. So how do you prepare the students for this? Um, education programs? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I also think I'm really struck by um, how we're all representing all these different paths that one can use to go into the museum as an institution. And it really talks about the potential and the richness of a museum to be a public forum for new kinds of curating, for new kinds of design, for understanding the techniques of art and understanding the properties of the object. And I would argue that the most important part of the museum is its, its role in the public sphere and understanding the publics that come to museums and the publics who don't come to museums, but who we want to come to museums. So when I visit museums, I go and I get 
involved in the museum just as much as you do, but I'm also watching the other people very carefully. I'm fascinated by looking at other people in museums, and I'm watching what their behaviors are, and I'm watching where they're going, and I'm looking at who's coming. I was at the Monorat today teaching, and I'm watching the different visitors. And that is part of my training as a museum studies professional, because we train students, and there's a whole avenue of training in, in the field of visitor studies or visitor evaluation of how to look at visitor behaviors, how to look at visitors and what they're experiencing, and really learning from how your public is experiencing the museum, and then deciding, well, maybe we will, should change this program because visitors are doing something that we weren't expecting them to do. Or maybe we shouldn't change this program, but because we don't, we, we want to only be reaching a certain visitor and a certain kind of stakeholder or critic, and that's not important to us what the, the five-year-olds are doing in the gallery. So there are a lot of techniques that are taught in museum studies programs, and Moza, you probably learned a lot of them in, in your program about how to target your audience, how to understand your audience, how to research your audience, how to research demographics. One technique is to send students out to a museum in a community that they don't feel comfortable in and to really try to read that museum or read that community through. We, we say pretend that you have just landed on Mars and you're seeing a museum there. So to really try to take people and take them out of their comfort zone and have them look at things through different eyes and different points of view. Diversity is extraordinarily important to the museum field and the museum experience. And so again, there are techniques for teaching about researching diversity and a, a lot of different exercises and research projects that, that help people become more fluent in the idea of diversity and attracting diverse visitors. And that's the short answer. Yes, thank can you. I, can I just yes, add a little something? Yeah. I know we want to open it up to the audience soon, right. but um, there's a whole other um, really exciting thing going on in museums, which is participatory programming. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes alongside with, with museum education and visitor uh, studies, is using the museum, using the gallery as a place for um, participation and learning through doing. Um, of course, there's docents and um, gallery programs in the gallery for kids, for people with disabilities, for expanding audiences, where they can come and you know work with and learn about the art. But there's also social media websites, and and so museums are getting very savvy mm -hmm. working with um, the public and public that may not even come to the museum, but are accessing it through the website or through social media and getting them involved by inputting and having conversations and making suggestions for what should be added to the next exhibition. Um, so I think it's, it's a really interesting and, and important um, trend these days to engage, not just show and educate, but to, right. yeah. So the key word is engage and experience, seems that, at this stage. Mm -hmm. And reaching visitors wherever they are and ensuring that they're comfortable inside the museum so that they w will, so it's not just about educating the public. Mm -hmm. We're far from that now. So there's not one authoritative voice in the museum anymore. We're looking at the many voices that come in. Hi, um, I just want to uh, put forward a question, you know, uh, after you talk about, you know, museum perfection in a uh, academic world, possibly, um, can I raise a uh, question, ask your opinion about, uh, you know, museum perfection in the real world? Uh, lately, I think, uh, you know, uh, the British Museum is under siege, so as a director of the uh, British Museum, you know, um, in regard to you know, returning the Elgin marble back to the Greece. In your opinion, how, how do you deal with, you know, an issue like that? 
like Marjorie talked about, you know, the director need to know about the history. So how, how can he balance history and in relation to, you know, uh, you know, having, you know, the general public to assess a piece of such a valuable piece of, uh, you know, antiquity in, in London, you know, um, so can I just be okay. courageous um, to ask your opinion about this? Okay, Marjorie. Be first and then, no, I think we all, can, Glenn and I are both like, one. let's <laughs> both jump on it, yes. so go for it, Glenn. Oh, well, do you want to? I'm well, going to well, talk about I, I think because you, you mentioned two points that may be relevant is one, a director knowing his history mm -hmm. and ethics. And ethical practice. And ethical practices, so maybe you want to Okay, all right, so first. ethical practice, for, for those of you who probably remember from your philosophy class, is about, now remember, I come from a social justice institution which would say do the right thing, but what is the right thing? It's balancing many, many different points of view and understanding history and understanding the pros and cons and challenges and understanding where your core philosophy and core vision comes from as a professional. So those are the kinds of skills and debates that we all engage in all the time. And so from my personal ethical moral position on this kind of issue is that I personally, as a professional, believe that objects should be repatriated to the cultures that made them when those cultures ask for them back. And so that, that's, a, that's a personal professional value. What I would say is that all institutions have their own sets of values and their own histories and their own core ethics. And what I can do with students is have them articulate those ethics and say what they would do in that situation. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I too. I mean, I'll, I'll start with, with where Marjorie left off and say I, I would completely agree that museums need to develop better ethical standards and better practice and protocols for addressing these really difficult issues such as the Parthenon marbles. Um, but there are many other instances of uh, objects in museums where they, the constituent groups are ask, asking for them back one way or the other. And it's not easy. Um, for you know uh, anyone to, to make these decisions, so I'm I'm not in, the, in a very short period going to offer my own opinion. Although I use the, the Mar Parthenon marbles as as a, a case study in my classes, I just taught a, um, a an introduction to museum studies class, and I started with museums and nationalism. I think we'd be naive to think that museums don't play a role in telling stories about the past, owning the past, framing the past, and um, I think that it's really important to see museums as not being, um, you know, ha having a, a potential role in, in sort of laying claims to the past and telling these narratives. And I've had some very interesting discussions with some of the staff at TCA and the Louvre Abu Dhabi since being here this term, they have the job of creating a universal museum. Now, who's done that since Napoleon? I mean, there, there are you know, the British Museum, the Met, the Louvre, there are these large universal museums in the world, but they're having to ask themselves, what stories do we tell about the past? And how do we tell it in this part of the world in a, in a day of uh, transnationalism and multiculturalism? So they have a very interesting challenge. And inevitably, they will be attacked because every, everyone is. You have to make decisions. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. And, and there's a conference going to be here over the next two days on museums and nationalism. Uh, so it's a very hot topic. And repatriation is, is central to all of that. So thank you for asking that great question. Great. Um, hi. Um, you talked about targeting audiences. And I want to know, how is it possible for the museums opening, opening here in the UAE, such as the Louvre and the Guggenheim, universal museums, to, to target the local population that prior to this didn't have any universal museums in the country? 
Um, uh, one of the ways that um, um, they could be used, we use um, a visitor survey, uh, whether it was on a paper or online survey, where um, we do, um, and we usually do that at the opening of, um, like when we open temporary exhibition related to the collection that is hosted, whether it was in Guggenheim or the Louvre or the uh, Zayed National Museum. And we tend to document um, um, the visitor attendance and we tend to uh, send out surveys that actually um, people can answer questions such as, um, are you, which collection, uh, which piece that you're most interested in and uh, what would you like to see in the future, what kind of art, what kind of media. So um, we do gather a, a database of um, the surveys that we do over um, the years. And we usually do that for um, a lot of exhibitions. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we usually do it before the opening and then we do it where, uh, during the content development of the exhibition itself and then we do it after the closing of the exhibition so when we do uh, develop the next exhibition we, we kind of uh, study small part of the audience that we're expecting uh, let's say within Saudi art region so this is one of the ways that we do study it Hi, as um as music, dance, and theater are increasingly showing up in museums, sort of being repackaged as live art, uh, I'm wondering, especially Lee, uh, you know, in the context in the performing arts administration world, uh, curatorial studies are not really put forward uh, other than at Wesleyan, uh, from what I understand. Right. So I'm wondering how that's changing uh, what's happening within the curatorial studies field as it's adapting to, to live art and performance? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, one of the great sort of pleasures of working on the curatorial studies program is that the curriculum is completely flexible and responsive to uh, contemporary developments. So because we're not working with the kind of weight of art history, we can really look at what's happening now and decide what it is that our students need. So for example, even this year, our students are learning, uh, are doing two modules on performance and dance actually within the program on the strategies for uh, exhibiting them, working with performers, programming, um, even the sort of very little literature that's been written to date. And um, I'd say it's not just performance, as the other sort of media that we're looking at, sort of newer media are things like sound art how do you work with um, art where there isn't an object you know, at all? Um, it's just sound. Um, we're also looking at um, a working with uh, engagement or experience, curating experiences. So this is a little kind of um, new even for us, but we've taken it on. And I think it's not just us. I know that um, our peer programs at the Royal College in London and at Bard are doing the same thing. So, they're definitely conversations we're open to and, and want to have. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of the, the concept of the special exhibition? You know, the one where there, there may be corporate sponsorship, there may not be. There's the creation of a sense of, um, of event. Uh, you, you, you apply for a ticket. If you're lucky, you get one. You turn up for your slot, and then you are pushed through the museum space in a pulse. Uh, perhaps 30 minutes from the next group. And, and it just, you know, what triggered it in my mind was the reference to putting the, the visitor first. And, and I find I, I go off, I've, I've actually gone off these special exhibitions, which is a pity, some of them were wonderful. But the concept of being pushed through um, Herculeum and Pompeii again, I, I felt like um, I was actually there at the time. <laughs> well, anyone well. wants to say? Um, do you mean like blockbusters? Right. Is that what we yeah. yeah. And th that's yeah. also the, the ticket price now for the blockbusters is it's, uh, too high, I think. But the, for, I can answer, I know for the museums on Saudi at Island, for the, at least for a start, there would be free and there'd be free entrance, but you may still have to stand in lines. So uh, the beginning at least. Well, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because you want people but you don't want too many people. And certainly if you're one of those people, you don't want too many people. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. And um, 
uh, it's, you know, we have to think more broadly about this kind of culture of art appreciation that we're breeding or making the museum a popular place. We have to realize it will become a popular mm -hmm. place and it will become full. So I think then the sort of flip side of that will come back to exhibition design as well with... Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, I mean, a great example is um, the Kusama work at the Seeing Through Light. We had people lining up for 30 minutes and 40 minutes because they really want to see that type of artwork. And we had to time people to get in, like four at a time and then five at a time. Some people with strollers, some people... So I, th I, at some point, I think it's a good thing that people actually waited in line for like 30 minutes just to see one installation in a whole exhibition. But um, the guards and the controlling it, it was really challenging. Yeah. But, yeah. If, if you want to, to watch something about it that I, we, I recommend to students, there's a great documentary uh, that was made about Robert Hughes, the Australian art critic, uh, and it's called The Mona Lisa Curse. And he basically looks at kind of the celebrity of art and what that has done to the institution, so that might, might point you in some directions. Also, there are ways, coming from the children's museum world, um, there are, are techniques of customer service for when people are waiting in line. There are things that you can do to make that wait pleasurable because there are some pieces you really can only allow five people in yeah. at a time. Um, and, and the wait is also part of the experience. So um, I've, I've kind of changed my tune on those special exhibitions when I analyzed the financials of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and saw how important those are and how some people only want, it's hard to believe, but there are some people who only will go to a, an exhibition if it is crowded because they want to be part of the crowd. So I, I've kind of had to change my thinking about that. Us museum people, we like to be the only person in the gallery. <laughs> we, we know when the hours are. We know to get yeah. there at certain hours. I mean, when you work in the field, you know where you, how to go and be the only person in the Sistine Chapel. But for the average novice visitor who we really want to serve, they, they, some people really enjoy that crowd and there are also techniques to make sure that everybody is enjoying their experience. 